I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room issues. Was you don't ever say to her that her point about the Chicago incident. 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 She's qualified for services. We left. We're more of a community. We're trying to back over. doing an autism. General Norman Schwarzkopf called him the finest combat correspondent of our generation, a soldier's reporter and a soldier's friend. In his 50 years in journalism, Joe Galloway was assigned to cover Japan, India, and the former USSR, among other places, reporting from numerous combat operations. In 1998, he received a Bronze Star Medal with Valor for rescuing wounded soldiers while under fire, the only Medal of Valor the U.S. Army awarded to a civilian for actions during the Vietnam War. We'll talk with him about the battle that changed the war in Vietnam. The book he co-authored with Lieutenant General Hal Moore, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, and about sacred debts. Here's our conversation with Joe Galloway. Joe Galloway, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. You come from a family of soldiers going back all the way to the Civil War. And in fact, you were born just a couple of weeks before Pearl Harbor and didn't meet your father, who was serving in World War II, until the end of 1945. And with that as your history, I'm wondering if you have felt as if you were destined to become a war reporter. I think it was either that or a soldier. In fact, I was on my way to join the Army, uh, and my mother reminded me of my love of journalism, and we were passing the daily newspaper on the two blocks short of the recruiter's office, and I said, good call, Mom, stop. And I went in the newspaper office and asked if they happened to need a reporter, and they happened to need a reporter and hired me on the spot, 35 bucks a week. Which was fairly good money. Oh, well, it seemed to me to be pretty good. <laughs> Did your father come home damaged from World War II? No, I don't think so. He, 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 like all of them, came home in such a hurry. They had lost four or five years of their lives. And they, were, they seemed to me to be in, in driven to get things moving, to build a family, to get a house, to you know, get a decent job. Back to that reporting job that you landed day one, you immediately began to work on your bosses to send you to Saigon. Eventually they sent you to, uh, to Tokyo, Japan, and from there y you got your wish. Yeah, I, I was from 1963 onward. I knew we were going to war in Vietnam. I was just dead certain of it. Uh, and it was going to be, uh, it was going to become an American war and it was going to be my generation's war. And I wanted to cover it. I thought it'd be 40 years on, it would be a lot easier to explain why you went than why you didn't. Uh, if you didn't, it's, it's kind of like going to the movie of your generation. And when the crucial moment comes on, you're outside uh, buying a bag of popcorn or something. Uh, so I wanted to be there. And uh, You wanted to be there, but you also prepared yourself in, in, in a lot of ways to be there. You read about the history of the people. You read about the history of the conflict uh, in Vietnam and said once that you wished that our civilian leaders had, had read as you had. Yeah. Uh, if you if you aren't reading that stuff, you you don't know who you're fighting. You don't know what their history is. You you don't know that the Vietnamese uh, had been at war for 1,500 years. They'd been invaded six times by China, and sometimes China came and took the place and kept it for 600 years, and then they were driven out. And both of those events are marked by a river of blood on each end. Uh, and the, that means these people, they, they were used to fighting for survival. And they don't give up easily. And they don't give up at all. And uh, I, I've, it's always puzzled me that, that a country is, with as many smart people as we have, as many historians as we have, uh, don't get it. That our leaders don't read history, don't study it. Uh, and go out and pick a fight with the toughest kid on the block. Doesn't make sense to me. 
when we were kids, you you know, you go around the Italian neighborhood or you get your butt kicked. Uh, wow, there's nothing different in living in this world. You, you don't start a fight with people who do that for sport like the Afghans. Uh, and we just don't learn. I, I want to talk a little bit about what you're best known for, but before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Jeffrey Record and a study he did about who lost Vietnam. I, if you listen to lots of popular press on it, it's, it was the media that lost the war in Vietnam, uh, or it was anti-war demonstrators. In, in your opinion, who lost the war in Vietnam? Oh, it's, a, it's an onion, and you have to peel all the layers to get to the answer. And uh, the answer is uh, everybody had a hand in it. But the, those most responsible were a series of presidents who lived at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and uh, some generals who didn't think as smart as they should have. Uh, did the media have anything to do with it? I don't, I don't think so. We don't start wars and we don't stop them. We don't have that kind of power. But a president does and sometimes a general will. Uh, we had four years of uh, William C. Westmoreland as the supreme commander in Vietnam. And uh, Westmoreland looked like a general, but he was dumb as a fence post. Uh, he, his own aide said that, that General Westmoreland had a strategy of attrition, which is proof you have no strategy whatsoever. You think you're just going to drown your enemy in blood and that he will get tired of it. Hey, uh, not one year, not the worst year of fighting that we had in Vietnam did we ever kill more North Vietnamese than were being born back home that year, the next class, the next class after that. So if you can't beat the birth rate, you can't beat the people. You were a 24-year-old reporter when you landed for the Battle of Yadrang. That became a, a book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, which was written with Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore. Tell us a little bit about the pledge you made back in November of 1976 to write that book and how it finally came to be. Well, I think we knew we were going to have to write that book the day we left the Yadrang Valley, uh, November 16th, 1965. Uh, I knew as a UPI wire service reporter, the, the, the slogan used to be that the second coming of Christ was worth 1,200 words and everything else was worth less. Uh, and so I knew that, that I was going to get maybe a thousand words to tell this story in. And that wasn't going to do it. There was too much suffering. There was too much heroism. There was too much bloodshed. Uh, and this was a big thing. It was the first major battle of a war that would the, go on for 10 years. The turning point, and, yeah. and this is because of the, the use of helicopters in this battle. Uh, that, that uh, and both sides were, we were testing the helicopter and its power to deliver men to a battlefield, to deliver artillery pieces and keep them supplied. The enemy was testing its men could they stand against this kind of modern technology, this American firepower? We had control of the air. We had artillery pieces. Uh, they had rifles and occasionally a mortar or an RPG. Uh, but everything that they had had to come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail on the back of somebody or on a bicycle. And it took two or three months to get it down down to where the battlefield was, and uh, it gets shot up real quick. And then they got to have another another load coming down. So both sides were testing each other, and uh, in my view, nobody won in such a horrific encounter with so many dead and so many wounded. Who can claim 40, victory? Forty-four percent of American troops died in that three-day battle. Yeah, 
It it was uh, there were there was a bata the battalion that that relieved us at X-ray was ambushed the next day at a place called Landing Zone Albany, and they lost 155 men killed and 125 wounded in about six hours' time, uh, and they they basically went home in two or three uh, deuce and a half trucks where they had been a battalion of 450 men. On one day, the next day, half of them were gone. The book and the movie, both of which were highly acclaimed, did they, to some extent, quiet the ghosts of war for you and for the men who, who fought there? You know, something as horrific as that, which you have witnessed, participated in, uh, you don't you don't close the loop on that. It doesn't go away. If anything, and I, I, I said this in a in a book once. I wrote a chapter for Jan Scruggs, who's the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund guy, and put out a little paperback book. And I wrote a chapter, and I said, uh, basically, it doesn't get easier; it gets worse, because at the time we were all young. And we didn't know about life. We had no grasp of it. And these men who died would never know. And so we, we live life partly for them. And we know how sweet it is and what they gave up. You talk about it as a, a sacred debt, a debt to live your life to the fullest in honor of the men who didn't come home. You have to. You have to. This is, that's my way of, of keeping the ghosts at bay. You continued to cover wars, uh, at least a half a dozen more after four tours in Vietnam. And I wonder how you, you, you <laughs> did that uh, year after year. Uh, you know, best way to explain it, I guess. I, I went over before the Gulf War during Operation Desert Shield when, when we were building up our force in Saudi Arabia uh, for the Gulf War. And I went over and I spent time with, uh, with my old 7th Cavalry unit uh, as it was constituted now. And uh, Who was left, you mean? Yeah. And uh, all the soldiers are 20 years, 30 years younger than I am, and uh, they all crowd around, and, and I wear the right shoulder patch and, uh, of a veteran, and I, they figure, if that guy can make it, I can make it too. And so you become sort of a good luck piece mm -hmm. for the new generation of soldiers. You're, you're there to cover them, but they, they they embrace you as a brother and, and a father, as someone who uh, has been there before and they, and they crowd around and the question is, uh, what's it really like, sir? What am I gonna face? What, what's gonna happen to me? I talked to the reporters as too. Well. Yeah. They asked me to write a, write a three or four page piece kind of telling all of the, we sent 37 embeds from Knight Ritter to the Gulf War and uh, to the invasion of Iraq. And they asked me to write a, an essay telling them what they needed to know to keep from getting killed. And that was, that's one piece of duty. The other piece of duty though is to the soldiers. And that drew me back more than once. You followed really in the footsteps of, of Ernie Pyle who reported on World War II. And if you look at the way Ernie Pyle has been described, the same exact things have been said of you. You are a, a, a soldier's reporter. You were loved by, by soldiers and not all reporters in, in war zones were, were even liked by, by soldiers. It you know, I liked soldiers. I love soldiers. Uh, I spent time with them. I, I didn't want to sit in Saigon and cover the briefings. I came there to cover the war. And Ernie Pyle was, was my hero. I, I read his stuff and, and, 
if I always said that if my war had a generation, I wanted to cover it, and I wanted to cover it like Ernie Pyle covered his war. Uh, he was he was he wrote beautiful stuff, very simple. Uh, the the there there's a piece that he wrote a column about the death of Captain Warshaw, who was from T Temple, Texas, uh, and how his men were affected by his death, and and how they paid their respects on that terrible battlefield in Italy in World War II. Uh, he just brought out so much emotion. They were like personal letters home to 14 million Americans who, who prayed for Ernie Pyle the way they would pray for the safety of their own son. And of course, he died in 1945 in, in Oka, uh, Okinawa. Because Almost of the end of it. And, uh, uh, did, you know, someone here a year ago sent me a picture. Ferdy Pyle, after he was shot and killed, had probably there was more peace in his face than had been in five years of war. He was at peace. And no one wanted to get out of war more than Ernie Pyle. In fact, he, was, he took a break at one point and said he, he could not go back. He was so tired of it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What a, what a guy. You know, and he's totally forgotten. He's totally forgotten. There, uh, in uh, Indiana, which was his home, they had a, an Ernie Pyle Museum. That's closed down. And his, uh, his home was a place of, for visitors. Uh, they're closing that, too. So all memory of him is, is pretty much uh, wiped out. Uh, except for a few of us who know what, what Ernie Pyle stood for. Speaking of uh, a, a few of us, you covered the Vietnam War, which was the, the most openly covered war in U.S. history. Compare covering uh, Vietnam to covering uh, Afghanistan, for example. Vietnam, was, as you say, is totally open. Uh, you got there, you had a letter from some editor saying he'd buy your stuff or he'd run your stuff or whatever. Uh, that was good enough that we get you a press card. And uh, the press card was everything. That was your ticket to ride. You could ride on any government uh, transport. You could go out in the field with a battalion of troops and you could stay three hours or three days or a month if you want, if you wanted to. And, and it seemed worth it to you. Uh, I knew guys who came over uh, from a small newspaper and uh, traded in the back half of their plane ticket and skimped and saved to stay. They had meant to stay a month and stayed a year uh, so they could write the stories, uh, mail them home. Uh, it, was, uh, it was wide open and uh, it would never be that, it was never that way before, and it was never that way after. Uh, the wars now, uh, you got to pledge not to do all kinds of things. You said you, you have to sign you, a 36-page document. You sign a 36-page document. document saying that what you, you won't do. What you won't do and what you have to do, and, and it's not censorship, but it's control, and uh, they have control. And it's not, it's not wide open and free like it was in Vietnam. And I don't know if it ever will be again. This year alone, 43 uh, reporters have been killed covering wars. Since 1992, over 1,014. In Vietnam, 70 reporters yeah. died covering the war. Yeah. It's a dangerous business, and never more so than today. I, I think that I don't know what the total was in a, in our Iraq experience, but somewhere in the near 200, I think. Uh, it was a very dangerous place, and uh, people have you know no respect for journalists. Uh, they're just another target. Uh, it's a 
You know, I was never quite so frightened as I was in downtown Baghdad, uh, trying to spend a couple of days at the at the Knight Ritter Bureau and uh, then go out with the troops at Camp Victory, which is, you know, the airport. It's 10 miles away. And the hotel we were in was not inside the green zone, it, and we had armed guards all around it. Uh, we had armed guards and a, and a jail cage at the elevator on our floor of that hotel, and we had a we had a, a retired British S special services guy with a machine gun uh, guarding our bureau, and to get from there to down down to the airport and to Camp Victory to to go out with my embed, uh, it took two cars. Uh, the guard with the gun, I've got bulletproof vest on and all that stuff, and you're, you're stuck in traffic. You know, anybody can step up and kill you, and, and some would like to. You uh, did your last tour in 2006. You were 65 years old, and your last <laughs> tour was in, in Mosul yeah. uh, uh, near, near Baghdad. What, what ultimately said to you, I can't do this anymore? Time to do something else. You know, what really did it was uh, I was on a patrol in Mosul with uh, striker vehicles. There were three of these armored cars, and I was in one of them, stuck in, sticking my head out the back hatch, talking to a sergeant. And we'd been patrolling for about three hours, and he, he was saying, this is the most peaceful patrol we've had in seven months that we've been here. And if you're responsible, you can just stay for the rest of our tour. And he had no more got that out of his mouth than all hell broke loose, heavy machine gun fire and everything else. And we had two uh, Kiowa warrior helicopters flying over us as a cap uh, to protect us if we got ambushed. Uh, and one of them had just been shot down. And we were immediately vectored to that by his wingman who had the coordinates, and then we just punch him into this blue screen thing and bang, we're there in two minutes. And uh, we, we got out and, and there was a, like someone had dug a foundation about a half a block and 20 feet deep. And any hole in the ground in Iraq they use it for garbage, and this had become a garbage pit, and the helicopter had crashed into this garbage pit. Mm. And we, it had been raining, it was very cold, and we slid down in the mud, down the side of this garbage pit, and then we had to find the helicopter, and it was garbage too. It had been just ripped, all smushed. And uh, finally we saw a little tendril of smoke and we ran over there and pulled the wreckage apart and brought out the pilot and, and he was dead. And then we pulled out the co-pilot and he was alive. There was a heartbeat, uh, a pulse. And they rushed him and we, you know, slipping and sliding and up the side of this thing and got him into a striker to go to the helicopter point. He died before he got there, and uh, I was standing there in the rain uh, with tears on my cheeks. I knew what was going to happen. I knew that two army cars are going to pull up tomorrow at two houses in Florida where there's two widows and five little kids under the age of four, and their lives are going to be destroyed. So what I'm saying is that the last dead men that I saw in war were the same as the first. Nothing had changed except that I had seen too much of it. And I said, that's it. There, one of those widows would not even talk to the Army survivor officer. She would only talk to me. You carry an awful load. The more wars you covered, the more anti-war you became. And so I'd like to end by asking you, under what circumstances 
should the U.S. go to war? For survival of the country only. Only if it is totally in our national security interest. It's not worth uh, going and starting a war uh, for nothing, for suspicion, for I don't like that guy. None of this is worth it. There's too much dying. There's too much suffering. We send our soldiers and our Marines five, six, seven combat deployments today, and somehow we expect their wives and their kids to be unaffected. We expect them to come home unaffected, and it doesn't work that way. This country is going to face a butcher bill for Iraq and Afghanistan that will last a lifetime. Thank you, Joe Galloway, so much for talking with us. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Joseph Galloway. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find an excerpt from his book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.